Called to be branches in Christ's body, we yearn to be connected to the vine. Called to be mustard trees offering shade to God's creatures, we search for places to plant the seeds of faith. Called to be growing with God in the midst of this world's painful questions, we seek God's nurturing presence. Let us stand, and we will now read together responsibly. Come, worship the God whose love is revealed in Jesus. Beloved, we are called to love as God loves. Our human family circles the globe in places we know and in places we'll never see. Love with open hearts and open hands. Let us join together as we read our invocation, followed by the Lord's Prayer. Loving God, prune away our fears and failures, our heartaches and crushed dreams. Nurture new growth, new hopes, and new possibilities, that our lives might flower and flourish in the warmth of your tender love. Through Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning, church. Thank you for being here on this gorgeous spring day. A very warm welcome to our visitors as well as our members, whether you sit in our sanctuary or you're watching the video from home. The heart of our church is summed up in these words. No matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. Please be sure that you signed the attendance sheet upon entering and gave us your phone number. And instead of passing the offering plates, we have donation boxes located near the exits. Our Thursday Bible study resumes this Thursday, May 6th, to begin a discussion of Lucinda Seacrest McDowell's book, Soul Strong, Seven Keys to a Vibrant Life. Jimmy will have copies after the service if you are interested. And the next Seeds of Faith book selection is The Shepherd's Wife by Angela Hunt, and the book discussion is on May 23rd. You can contact Lisa Larson Hill about getting a copy of the book. Also, mark your calendars for May 22nd. Here at the church, we will have our annual youth car wash fundraiser. Uh, So come, bring your cars out, invite your neighbors. We'll be here from 9 to 3. And again, that's on Saturday, May 22nd. For our prayers this week, we want to remember Maria Oppenheimer, who fell recently and suffered a fractured pelvis. She is in the Stern Center for Rehabilitation. Marge Henning, who has a fractured sacrum. It could take a month to heal, but fortunately, she can stay home as she heals. Joan Hawkins David, the mother of Jody Miller, who has suffered with dementia and is near the end of her life and needs our prayers. Also, Zach Samuel, the 21-year-old son of church member Suja John Cuddy, will have another brain scan here in May. And the doctors are hopeful that the image is scar tissue and nothing worse. So let us hold all of these in our thoughts and prayers this week. At the end of today's service, parents may get their children from the South Lounge, which is downstairs. And following today's service, if we have any youth today, uh, we will meet over here in the chapel area briefly. And now at this time, if you are able, I'd like to ask you to please stand and socially distance greet those around you. Our scripture lesson this morning comes from the book of John, chapter 15, verses 1 through 5 and 8 through 11. I am the true vine, and God is the vine grower. God removes every branch in me that bears no fruit. Every branch that bears fruit, God prunes to make it bear more fruit. 
You have already been cleansed by the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me as I abide in you. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit. God is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and become my disciples. As God has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept God's commandments and abide in God's love. I have said these things to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. In the reading of these words, may we hear the word of the Lord. Amen.
Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. <clears throat> Please take your order of service and we will read responsively our call to prayer. Peace be to you, O God. For the hope of new life. For the possibility of transformation. For loving us and listening when we pray. Generous God, as life expands, as we set aside the routines of the past year and learn new ones, we give thanks for all the places of new opening around us and within us. May we take in your expansive spirit, feeling joy in our individual places of opening up and breathing our thanks maybe even without a mask. We seek the courage of wider openings too, for anyone who has been squashed down or hushed up or worn out. May all of your people feel our lungs opening with new breath, our lives opening with new wisdom, our worlds opening with life-giving grace. Today we remember Zach Samuel, that his medical test would go well. We pray for Maria Oppenheimer and Marge Henning as their bones heal. We pray for Joan Hawkins David, that her passing would be peaceful. And we pray for all of those places in our world where the virus is surging. May they get the help that they need. We pray through the breath of your ever-blowing spirit. Amen. My father and sister are the gardeners of the family. My mother and I are most certainly not. We're so bad with plants, we've been known to kill artificial flowers. At this moment down in Tennessee, my dad is prepping his garden and getting ready to plant. Through the years, he's successfully grown yellow and zucchini squash, tomatoes, green beans, purple whole peas, sweet potatoes, bell peppers, cucumbers, onions, garlic, chives, thyme, rosemary, basil, and countless varieties of flowers. He's also grown blueberries, strawberries, blackberry, raspberries, muscadines, and grapes. Oh yeah, he has some fruit trees. Apple, pear, apricot, cherry, more than one variety of plum, and I mustn't forget his pecan tree. My mom and dad live on an acre, and my dad has made good use of every square inch. Unfortunately, I take after my mother in the regard of not being the gardener. Neither my mom nor I have the, the patience or the delicate touch it takes to nurture plants. Whenever a bush or tree needs pruning, my dad knows exactly what to do what tool to use, how much to cut off, etc. My mom, on the other hand, always gets carried away. She viciously hacks and whacks her way through the job, and when she brings out the electric hedge trimmer, keep your distance. When she's finished pruning, there's only a huge pile of limbs and a stump where a bush used to be. In today's scripture lesson, Jesus explains that like any good gardener, God prunes the vines. 
We all hope that God prunes more like my dad than my mom. In our scripture lesson today from John chapter 15, Jesus tells his disciples that he is the true vine and that God is the vine grower. The 1611 King James Version translates it vine dresser. Vine dresser is an old-fashioned word. I kind of like it. Today we would call vine dressing either viticulture, the science, study, and production of grapes, or viniculture, which is specific to grapes for winemaking. Talented vine dressers were crucial in the time of Christ. Wine was an everyday beverage for most people. Archaeologist Patrick McGovern of the UPenn Museum says that wine was often safer to drink than water in ancient times. He explains that the antioxidants found in the additives and the alcohol itself killed harmful microorganisms. So wine was much safer than raw, unfiltered water. Never thought of water as being raw. But wine was also important in the religious ceremonies, including Passover and eventually Holy Communion. Catherine McElhiney and Catherine Turner explain how one goes about growing grapes that remain true to form, writing. To produce fruit true to type, a vine is grafted on to a strong root stock. Two plants, in effect, become one. The root stock goes deep into the ground, drawing up the nutrients that the plant needs. In their turn, the branches grow from the main plant and break into leaf and tendril. The problem is that left to themselves, the branches will grow and grow. This may be a joy to watch and a fine example of exuberant growth, but it is unfortunately at the expense of any grapes that may be trying to grow on the vine. The plant is so busy sending energy to the farthest reaches of the branches that the poor grapes kind of get bypassed. So it's necessary for the vine dresser to curb the branches' enthusiasm. The branches are pruned back almost to the grapes so that the energy is channeled into fruitfulness and not into foliage. At the same time, any branches not bearing fruit are removed so that the plant's energy goes directly to its fruit. Speaking of pruning, we have all been pruned by the pandemic over this past year. Life as we knew it was ripped away, leaving us worried. Worried about the most basic building blocks of life, including food. There were so many unknowns for months after the pandemic started. We wondered, how do we get food safely if we're afraid to go into a grocery store? Should we pay extra and get it delivered? Do we need to wipe down the boxes and bags with Clorox wipes to safely bring them into our homes? Is takeout safe? Is pizza delivery safe? And when will we eat in a restaurant again? And then another building block of life, of course, is good health. During the pandemic, washing our hands could be a matter of life and death. We were advised to wear masks, but which ones? Surgical, N95, homemade? Which one was the best at keeping the virus at bay? And should we use a filter with it? We learned the words social distancing and tried to keep at least six feet away from each other while wearing masks both indoors and outdoors. Luckily, the outdoor one is kind of starting to pass. Well, what are we to make of our lives over this past year? I believe it's important to realize that we've been given a year of living differently. 
we've been given the opportunity to examine our lives and ask what we've learned and what might we do differently after the pandemic. It's like the biggest New Year's resolution of all time. Many of us are still sorting through our experiences of the past year and trying to determine what to do differently on the other side of the pandemic. The deadly virus showed us again and again that life is too short to waste doing things that we don't want to do, though brushing our teeth and taking out the garbage are non-negotiable. So here are examples of questions that we might ask. Do you want to stop saying yes to things if your heart is not in them and instead learn to say no to those things that are unfulfilling? After all, we can only say yes to a finite number of things in life. We should make our yeses count. Do you ask yourself, how long should you keep working if you have enough resources to live comfortably for the rest of your life? Do you contemplate retiring early and doing something entirely different with your life? As someone quipped, no one ever said on their deathbed that they wished they had spent more time in the office. What do we need to let go of in order to change? and do something different. In nature and in our lives, pruning can spur new growth. The pandemic has certainly been one big year of pruning. With life stripped down to the bare essentials, let's ask, what really makes us feel happy and fulfilled? What brings us joy or meaning? I don't want to look back in 10 or 20 years with regrets of what I might have done or where I might have gone. So are we willing to go off the beaten path, to try the unexpected, to risk failure? What patterns and paths of your pre-pandemic life do you want to continue and what from your pre-pandemic life do you want to prune? Jesus gives us clues in today's scripture lesson, saying, As God has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept God's commandments and abide in God's love. I have said these things to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be made complete. So how does one move closer to experiencing joy in life? According to Jesus, it's all about abiding in him and in the love of God. Instead of the words abide, some translations use the words dwell, stay, or remain. So a twofold idea emerges our abiding with God and God abiding with us. Abiding with God means not giving up when the going gets tough, not throwing in the towel when life takes challenging twists and turns not forsaking God, even if we feel God forsaken. And I really like the notion of God abiding with us. Everywhere we go, every minute of every day, God abides with us. God stays around us and within us through thick and thin. Whether we're following God's way or Running as fast as we can in the other direction, God is with us. In times of jubilation and in times of utter dejection, God abides with us. God stays with us. 
from the moment we open our eyes in the morning until our head hits the pillow at night. As we sleep and snore and dream, God is there, abiding, watching, loving. God is with us as we play, as we pray, and as we prune, that our lives might branch out and be fruitful with an abundant harvest of peace and joy. Amen. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of God's Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And may the blessing of God Almighty, our Creator, our Redeemer, our Sustainer, be with you today and every day. Amen. <laughs>